Here we go, here we go, now one, two, three, four, one, something's got to give, two, something's got to give, three, something's got to give, yeah! The 2001 Invasion angle featuring WWF vs WCW and ECW didn't live up to expectations for many people. Sure, just like anything in professional wrestling, there are people out there who enjoyed the angle, but many felt the storyline suffered due to a lack of megastars on the WCW side. When we think of ECW's role in the Invasion though, well, that's a different story. The WWF already had a great deal of ECW originals on their roster, and they were also able to sign some big names in 2001 including Rob Van Dam, Rhino and Tommy Dreamer. When people think of the invasion though, and the reasons why it didn't work, they immediately look at the WCW side of things. After all, the Monday Night Wars was all about WCW vs WWF, so in a way, it felt like ECW was an afterthought in the invasion angle. When looking at the Invasion storyline too, one of the things that I felt was missing from the Alliance was the true identity of WCW. The company had such a rich history in their own style of wrestling production during the mid to late 90s that differed greatly from WWF. Yet during the Invasion storyline, they just seemed like another group of guys who were becoming more and more WWF-like as the weeks went on. Don't get me wrong either, capturing everything that made up what WCW was in the form of a faction was always going to be a difficult task, but Team WCW just didn't feel like THE WCW, if that makes sense. ECW, on the other hand, that's totally different. While the WWE weren't able to get all the hardcore originals in 2001 and while there were some guys who would have made things even better, the superstars who did get involved in the invasion were some of the best ECW had to offer at the time and Team ECW managed to bring their identity along with them when the invasion angle took place. They felt more like the ECW of old in comparison to WCW and the WCW of old. With the superstars Vince already had signed from Extreme Championship Wrestling and with the superstars that got signed for the invasion, there was a lot more the WWE could do that even goes beyond a wrestling ring. The WWE had all these ECW stars at their disposal, so the company decided to put them to use to create a DVD documentary that told the story of Extreme Championship Wrestling, named The Rise and Fall of ECW. The documentary, which was released in 2004, ended up breaking all DVD records for the WWE, becoming the company's biggest ever selling DVD at the time, and this proved that fans were still very interested in Extreme Championship Wrestling and the ECW brand. The rise and fall of ECW didn't sell well just because it had the ECW logo on the cover, but the documentary itself was really, really good. The WWE had and still have a reputation for changing the narrative a little in their documentaries, but this one was a warts and all retelling of the glory days and ultimate demise of Extreme Championship Wrestling. One ECW original who paid attention to the DVD sales was Rob Van Dam, a guy who was having a great WWE run at the time when the rise and fall of ECW hit the shelves. It was RBD who then approached Vince McMahon in regards to putting on an ECW reunion show on pay per view. RBD saw the passion fans still had for Extreme Championship Wrestling, and Vince McMahon probably saw the potential revenue gains from having such a reunion show. It was kinda surprising at the time and if you really think about it, it's still surprising now. The WWE aren't too fond of showcasing other entities on such a big scale, but seeing as the company owned ECW and seeing as the DVD sold so well, then there was nothing for Vince to lose really. In regards to approaching Vince about the idea, RVD said, During my matches there were people in the crowd who would always chant ECW. They were just kind of saying, hey, that spirit hasn't died in me either, I saw you at your best man. Because I knew that spirit hadn't died, I went to Vince McMahon and said, what's the reason why you haven't wanted to do an ECW one time pay per view? I really thought he was going to say, well the reason Rob is because I have this and this going on, but instead he said, well I think that's a great idea Rob, I think I could make a lot of money with that. Vince McMahon said, 
Rob's a smart man and he has really good ideas. Rob suggested, hey, let's do a reunion of sorts. And we did, and it was very interesting. ECW One Night Stand would take place on June 12th, 2005 in the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York City. Some call it one of the greatest nights in professional wrestling history, some call it a true return to form for ECW, but what Vince McMahon said was absolutely right, no matter what you may think of ECW One Night Stand in 2005, it was very interesting. Personally, I loved the show. What stood out for me was how the essence of ECW was captured during this reunion event, and if we go back to what I said at the top of this video, this was something the WWF or WWE could never do successfully with their purchase of WCW. They could never showcase what made WCW so special. ECW One Night Stand, on the other hand, is ECW. The way the show was produced, how matches would play out, One Night Stand is wrestling fan service done right. Booking duties were handed over to Paul Heyman, additional original ECW superstars were brought in to compete on the show. The production of the whole event just felt like ECW, everything was done to perfection here. It was brilliant. The distinctive look of the pay-per-view brought fans back in time to the glory days of extreme championship wrestling, and while the WWE did add their own touches such as a two-man commentary team and the arrival of Raw and Smackdown stars, it still didn't take away from the show overall. So what we're going to do here is take a look at One Night Stand 2005 and all the matches that took place on the evening. I always say this for videos like this, but to really, truly appreciate the show, you need to watch it from start to end. If One Night Stand 2005 is an event that you still haven't seen yet, then you're really missing out. Don't let this video be a substitute for watching the event itself, but do try to hunt down the original pay-per-view version if possible. I'll explain why a little later on. The show opens up with Joey Styles coming to the ring. Joey is here to introduce the fans to the show and also announce his broadcast partner for the night. Styles gets emotional here, you can see him trying his best to keep it together, and this really tells viewers at home what ECW meant to these guys and girls who worked for the promotion. Joey says, oh my god, as the fans go nuts, and Styles then introduces Mick Foley to the ring. Foley and Styles will provide commentary throughout the show. Joey used to commentate all on his own and apparently Joey wanted to call One Night Stand on his own also, but Mick Foley getting added was a WWE decision. Honestly though, Foley done a good job at One Night Stand and I don't think it took away from the broadcast. After playing a classic ECW opening video, we go back to the Hammerstein Ballroom for our first match, the Battle of the Thrill Seekers, Lance Storm vs Chris Jericho. To educate fans who maybe didn't watch ECW, we get highlights of Lance Storm when he was part of the Impact Players tag team, and when Chris Jericho comes out wearing the same old gear he wore back in 1996, Joey explains who Lionheart Chris Jericho was and why he's looking a little different tonight in comparison to his usual Y2J attire. What a great throwback this was, though Jericho coming out as Lionheart Chris Jericho was a real nice touch. Seeing as Lance Storm and Chris Jericho trained and teamed together during the early days of their careers, the two men had no problem putting on an entertaining opening bout that some consider the best match of the show. Keep in mind too that Lance Storm wasn't wrestling on a regular basis during this time period, yet he and Jericho still had a great performance here. The audience appreciated the chain wrestling at the beginning and the stalemate that followed. They appreciated the big impact moves and the big spots of the bout, and they got extremely loud when Just Incredible made an appearance and Jericho took a Singapore cane right to the head. The impact players reunite at one night stand and Lance Storm picks up a victory. It was smart putting these guys on first, fans of both ECW and WWE knew who Lance Storm and Chris Jericho were, so letting these guys showcase what they could do to open up the event made a lot of sense. The commentator said that this would be Lance Storm's final match, but this wasn't the case. Storm's next match after this one right here was against Brian Danielson in Ring of Honor. Joey Styles says that a balcony has been reserved for WWE Raw and WWE Smackdown superstars. They're expected to show up soon to crash the party and, apparently, they're gonna put ECW out of business once and for all. Pitbull Gary Wolf or Pitbull One then appears backstage to introduce a special video, a video honouring ECW superstars who passed away. 
This was really good to see too. Some of these guys didn't get televised tributes around the time of their passing, and the fans in attendance appreciated the video package. They break out in a loud Candido chant when we go back to the ballroom. The sinister minister James Mitchell and Mikey Whiprack bring Tajiri down for the next matchup. It's a three-way dance featuring the Japanese buzzsaw, Super Crazy and Little Guido. Joey Styles explains that an ECW three-way dance is contested under elimination rules, meaning we get a one-on-one -on -one match after the first pinfall or submission. There's a ridiculous amount of action packed into six minutes here. It starts off as your standard fast-paced three-way match with each competitor taking turns at getting in some offense, but things get extreme pretty quickly when Super Crazy pulls off a balcony moonsault, landing on Guido and the FBI. Tajiri spits his green mist while being held up for a powerbomb, and Mikey Whiprack pulls off a whippersnapper from the second rope that leads to Guido's elimination. Three moonsaults from Super Crazy are enough to put Tajiri away, but it's worth noting here that the fans let Super Crazy know that he messed up when a slight communication problem happened towards the end of the match. It was a very small thing, but it goes to show how the fans could cheer for you one moment and then the next they're letting you know that your planned spot didn't work out as intended. Still, Tajiri and Super Crazy had great chemistry, a little more time here would have been great as the match does feel a little rushed. A video plays that goes through some highlights of ECW's past, from Shane Douglas throwing down the NWA Championship in 1994 to Tommy Dreamer taking the Singapore cane shots from the Sandman. The next bout is introduced as an extreme luchador match, Psychosis vs Rey Mysterio. And a few things to note here. First, Psychosis comes out wearing his classic mask but he removes it once he gets to the ring. And secondly, Rey Mysterio gets introduced as Rey Mysterio Jr. The WWE dropped the Jr. from Rey's name upon his debut. Gonna be honest here, there's better Psychosis vs Mysterio matches out there. Bash at the Beach 1996 comes to mind, as does Road Wild 1998. But both men were also younger at the time. The Bash at the Beach match was almost 10 years before the one night stand bout. Also, the fans in attendance turned on Mysterio towards the end of the bout. He was loudly booed when he performed the 619, and at the beginning of the match, the fans chanted for Psychosis to put his mask on, and they also booed when Psychosis applied a sleeper hold. So yeah, the bout got a weird reaction from the audience. Psychosis got the crowd back on his side after performing a guillotine leg drop from the top rope to the barricade, and Ray got a good pop when he performed a seated senton from the top rope into the audience, but when Ray pulls off that 619, the audience rips him apart. Once Ray wins via pinfall though, and once the final bell rings, the crowd still stand up and applaud both men and the match that took place. The superstars of SmackDown then show up, led by Kurt Angle and JBL. The fans in attendance are very harsh, to say the least. Joel Gertner tries to interview the SmackDown superstars, but that doesn't go down too well. JBL seems to be in a foul mood tonight. Kurt Angle then rips into ECW, saying that the last time he appeared at an ECW show, he walked out halfway because it sucked. Kurt says he felt humiliated after appearing in ECW, and the fans of Extreme Championship Wrestling are a bunch of morons. Angle then promises that the SmackDown wrestlers will destroy any ECW superstar who steps into the ring tonight before passing the mic to JBL. Bradshaw says he sells out Madison Square Garden while ECW can't fill a bingo hall. And the fans of ECW are just annoyed because the WWE's presence reminds them of how low they truly are. The fans quickly let JBL know what they think of him. You love ECW. Bradshaw says any fan in the Hammerstein Ballroom can get in the ring right now and give the same level of performance as the ECW superstars, because the wrestling is so low tier. JBL, on the other hand, is a wrestling god. And the only reason this pay per view could be successful is because JBL decided to appear on it. One of a kind then plays in the Hammerstein Ballroom and out walks the man responsible for one night stand, Rob Van Dam. Van Damme is wearing a brace and he needs some help from Bill Alfonso. RVD unfortunately had to get knee surgery and he wouldn't be competing on the show that he pitched, but the crowd are excited to see RVD and RVD is excited to be there. 
Rob cuts a great promo that wasn't scripted. He talks about taking fans back to a time where he didn't only say the words whatever and cool in his promos. Van Damme tells the Smackdown superstars that the fans are excited to be at one night stand because they're sick and tired of seeing the same faces shoved down their throats when they want to watch professional wrestling. And you feel bad for RVD when he says missing one night stand was worse than missing the overseas tour of Japan, missing Booker T's wedding, and even missing WrestleMania. One night stand meant way more to Van Damme than all these things, and it does suck that the fans didn't get to see a Van Damme match on this pay per view. Rhino shows up and he gores RVD. The lights go out in the arena and Sabu appears, getting a thunderous ovation in the process. An impromptu match then begins between Sabu and Rhino, a match that showcased Sabu very very well for fans who were maybe unfamiliar with his high risk style of wrestling. After a referee bump, RVD is able to get in the ring and Rhino gets a chair smashed into his face courtesy of Van Damme, but you can tell that RVD was definitely in no condition to perform on this show. Sabu wins with a great top rope chair and table spot and the show moves on to its next segment. The Van Damme promo is must see though, even if you don't watch the entire show, you should definitely check out this heartfelt speech from RVD. The superstars of Raw then show up after another ECW highlight video gets played. Fans are literally spitting their drinks over Eric Bischoff as the Raw guys join the Smackdown guys on the balcony. Eddie Guerrero vs Chris Benoit is our next matchup and just like Lance Storm vs Chris Jericho and Rey Mysterio vs Psychosis, this is another match where both guys know each other extremely well. This too is the longest match on the card at 10 and a half minutes and it's very good. Fans will debate about which Benoit vs Guerrero match was the best and there's a ridiculous amount to choose from, especially if you go back to their WCW days, but this one at one night stand comes recommended. This shows another side of ECW that wasn't about weapons or being hardcore, this was about hard hitting in ring action. Guerrero and Benoit altered their usual match here by incorporating a lot more strikes. You still get to see some very good and very smooth wrestling moves from both men but there's an emphasis on punches and chops throughout this one. Eddie does use a chair at one point on the outside of the ring but there's only one chair shot. It happens mid match also so it isn't really a deciding factor in the bout. In the end, Guerrero taps out to the Crippler crossface. Joey Styles says that Benoit and Guerrero would turn out to be the most successful stars that came through ECW's doors during the company's entire history. That one is maybe up for debate but you can understand the point he was trying to get across. Both guys ended up having a lot of success in WWE years after their respective ECW runs. During the match, the fans completely ripped into Eric Bischoff and after Guerrero tapped out, Joel Gertner tried to interview Eric and get himself a job. Eric calls Gertner a piece of garbage just like everyone else inside the Hammerstein ballroom. Bischoff says he's the GM of the most prestigious wrestling brand in the world, Monday Night Raw. And Eric says he doesn't want to see any of these ECW geeks in attendance at any Raw shows in the future, including Joel Gertner. If Eddie Guerrero vs Chris Benoit showcased one side of ECW, then Mike Awesome vs Masato Tanaka definitely showcased the other side. Any fans inside the Hammerstein ballroom who wanted to see something a little more hardcore would have no doubt felt very satisfied after seeing this next matchup, it's absolutely brutal. The Raw superstars turned their backs from the ring during Mike Awesome's entrance, and during this bout also, Joey Styles absolutely destroys Awesome on commentary for jumping to WCW for more money. You get the impression that Joey was speaking from the heart here. Just like our previous matches, Tanaka and Awesome had history together and their previous ECW matches were also very, well, very extreme. But if there were fans out there who had never seen Awesome vs Tanaka before, then man, they were in for a surprise here. For me, this was the match of the night. Moments into the bout, Awesome dives over the top rope and onto Tanaka. Mike then finds himself in the audience and Tanaka comes charging at his opponent with a steel chair in hand. The impact is insane but we haven't even got started yet. Mike sets a table up on the outside, he gets up on the apron and Tanaka finds himself taking an Awesome bomb from the apron and through the table. The audience breaks out in a loud ECW chant as Tanaka begins grabbing his neck. Really hard chair shots but he isn't phased at all, he gets right back up and Awesome ends up taking a tornado DDT on the steel chairs. Tanaka isn't able to put Mike away after coming off the top rope with a chair in hand 
and Mike replies with a spear followed by a chair shot from the metal rope. Awesome grabs another table. He sets Tanaka up for a superplex, but Tanaka counters with a tornado DDT through the table. You'd think that would be the end of the match, but no. Awesome pulls off a sit down power bomb from the middle rope onto the broken table, and I always look at that piece of metal sticking up and what could have potentially happened here. Tanaka kicks out, Mike sets up another table on the outside, and Tanaka takes another power bomb, this time from the ring to the outside and through the table. Mike follows up by diving on top of Tanaka, and Mike Awesome wins via pinfall. A match you need to see to believe. Fantastic stuff, but not for the faint-hearted. Paul Heyman cuts an incredible promo next, and again, I can't talk about it and do it justice. You need to see it for yourself. An emotional Heyman thanks the fans of ECW before turning his attention to the Raw and SmackDown superstars in attendance. Eric Bischoff is first to feel the wrath of Heyman when Paul says it isn't Paul E with his tail behind his legs attending a WCW pay-per-view. Heyman then tells the fans to hide their wives because Edge is in attendance tonight before saying, quote, I've got two words for you, Matt freaking Hardy. And then the best line Heyman delivered, in my opinion. Paul turns his attention to JBL and he says, the only reason why you were WWE Champion for a year was because Triple H didn't want to work Tuesdays. Heyman then rallies up the audience, one more time for old time's sake. Paul says this isn't WCW, it isn't Monday Night Raw, it isn't Smackdown, it's not even WWE. This my friends is EC. And then it's time for the main event and the reason why you want to avoid the WWE Network version of One Night Stand. The final match features the Dudley Boys taking on Tommy Dreamer and the Sandman, and during the live pay-per-view version of One Night Stand, the WWE licensed Metallica's Enter Sandman for Sandman's entrance, and it's one of the very best entrances you'll ever see during a wrestling event. The fans sing every word of the song, and I wish I could play the whole thing here, but the video would get taken down straight away. The audience makes the entrance, the song plays in its entirety, and the energy inside the Hammerstein Ballroom is incredible. And keep in mind that this is the main event, usually fans are a little tired at this point, but not the ECW crowd in New York. Enter Sandman has been replaced by a generic clone theme on the WWE Network, and it really does hurt the show in my opinion. I know fans who haven't seen One Night Stand are probably thinking I'm talking out of my ass by saying this, while fans who have seen the Enter Sandman entrance know exactly what I'm talking about. But do yourself a favour and get the pay-per-view version if you want to see this event. It's still out there in its entirety, you just need to look. The Blue World Order show up before the match begins and Eric Bischoff looks on as Big Stevie Cool says you can't have an invasion without the BWO. And after announcing that the Blue World Order is taking over, Sandman gets hit with a Stevie kick. We then get run-ins from Kid Cash, Balls Mahoney and Axel Rotten, the BWO gets taken out with a few chair shots, and Kid Cash ends this initial segment by performing an assisted springboard somersault plancha that gets a great pop from the audience. The tag team match then takes place and it's another hardcore affair here. Tommy Dreamer and Bubba Ray Dudley use a cheese grater on each other's heads, you've got the Sandman performing swanton bombs on the ladders, you've got plenty of weapons, chair shots, loads of blood, it's an ECW fan service match and it goes down really well for those in attendance. Eventually, the Impact players get involved and this leads to Francine coming out to kick Tommy Dreamer in the balls. Beulah McGillicuddy then comes out to rescue Tommy Dreamer, and Beulah even gets physical with Lance Storm and Bubba Ray Dudley. In the end, Spike Dudley comes out with some lighter fluid, the Dudleys set a table on fire, and Tommy Dreamer gets powerbombed through a flaming table to end the match. The Sandman calls for a beer, feeling that a beverage may help him and his fallen tag team partner. And out comes Stone Cold Steve Austin, when the glass shatters, the Hammerstein Ballroom becomes unglued. Austin tells Sandman that he saw the way he drinks, he doesn't need one beer, he needs a case of beers. Stone Cold says though that he isn't just serving the Sandman a beverage, he wants the whole ECW roster to come out to celebrate the show. 
Out come the band of brothers who had just beaten the hell out of each other earlier in the evening, but Stone Cold wants to see a fight before the party begins. The WWE superstars are challenged to come down to the ring, Eric Bischoff leads the troops into enemy territory, and then Taz makes an appearance to join the ECW side for the brawl to end it all. Both teams begin fighting with each other, and this was when JBL started throwing live rounds at the Blue Mini, although that's been covered to death so I'm sure you know the story. After clearing out the WWE guys, Steve Austin wants Eric Bischoff brought into the ring. Eric had went on commentary at this point, so Mick Foley does the honours, and Eric finds himself surrounded by ECW superstars. Eric takes a 3D from the Dudleys, a diving headbutt from Benoit, a 619 from Rey Mysterio, and when Eric defiantly shouts fuck ECW into a microphone, Eric takes a stone cold stunner. The ECW stars celebrate in the ring, and the show fades to black with Steve Austin and Sandman standing at the entranceway. When we look back at the history of professional wrestling, ECW One Night Stand was definitely a special night. It was one of the good things that came out of WWE acquiring WCW and ECW, and it's a night that couldn't be replicated in the future. Although, the WWE did try with another One Night Stand the following year. I'll cover that in the future. I've said this a few times now, and I know I sound like a broken record, but this is a show you need to see for yourself. No YouTube video detailing the event will come close to experiencing what many thought would be ECW's final reunion. There's a certain atmosphere inside the venue that you can almost feel through your TV when watching One Night Stand, and that's what helps make it so good. There's some good wrestling here, plenty of hardcore action, there's some short ECW history lessons, and there's a tribute to those ECW superstars who weren't alive for one night stand. The event was a pay-per-view success too, leading to its sequel in the eventual revival of ECW, but again, I'll cover all this soon. Check this one out if you haven't seen it before, I guarantee you'll enjoy it. And please, subscribe to Wrestling Bios so you don't miss the upcoming ECW One Night Stand 2006 video. Thank you very very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this upload, and take care.